Hi, everyone. Welcome to the University of Toronto Joint Centre for Bioethics seminar series. My name is Jay Shaw, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our speaker is Dr. Mina Andiapin, and the seminar is titled Me, Myself, and AI, How Interacting with Artificial Intelligence Affects Employees' Expectations of and Attitudes Toward the Role of AI. So an exciting topic. And before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to let you know the seminar is being recorded. Uh, the lecture, along with other archived lectures, can be accessed through the Joint Center for Bioethics YouTube page. Um, the format for the seminar is a presentation by our speaker, followed by a facilitated discussion period. And uh, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the land uh, as we get started here, the land on which University of Toronto operates. Um, for thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the, the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of, of the Credit. And today, the meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to, to work and, and live on this land. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, Mina Andiapin, who's an Assistant Professor of Management and Organization at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at University of Toronto. She was previously an Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior at, at Montpellier Business School in France. She received her doctorate in organization studies from Boston College. And her work's been published in Academy of Management Review, Health Services Management Research, Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes and, and other important outlets. And uh, her research focuses on the intersections of ethics, emotions, AI, and health. Current projects include theoretical studies on healthcare workers' moral emotions, quantitative work on jealousy, envy, and ostracism, longitudinal qualitative work on misconduct evolution, effects on uh, necessary evil enactment for healthcare workers, and attitudes toward AI in the workplace. She's a she's a phenomenon driven researcher. So, Mina, on behalf of the JCB, welcome, and we'll look forward to your talk. Hi, Jay. Thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. I'm really happy to be here with you all today, and thank you so much for inviting me. So, the paper I am presenting today is a set of two studies um, that I've conducted with uh, colleagues of mine, and we are actually um, in the process of just finishing up data collection and writing up the paper. So I would really love to hear sort of thoughts and, and any feedback you have on the paper and the way it's framed, et cetera. And of course, we're open to, to any sort of um, comments that you might have and questions um, at the end of the, the presentation. So I look forward to that. Um, so the paper is entitled Me, Myself, and AI, How Interacting with Artificial Intelligence Affects Employees' Expectations of and Attitudes Towards the Role of Artificial Intelligence. So in our study team, um, this is a Shirk-funded uh, Shirk study. We received the funding um, last year and have, since then have been collecting data. Um, so I've run this project with colleagues um, at Maastricht University, so that's in the Netherlands, with Dr. Ruo Mo at Montpellier Business School in France, with uh, Dr. Jillian Hadfield, who's at the University of Toronto, um, both at Rotman and the Law School, and she's the head of the Sports Retina Institute here at U of T, with Sen Thujin, who is um, a wonderful research assistant on this project, and also one of our um, Master's in Health Administration students at IHPME, and then lastly with uh, um, Philip, who's at the Eindhoven University of Technology in, um, in the Netherlands as well. So it's really a, a lovely um, sort of experience to work with a team that's so international and we all come from um, differing disciplinary backgrounds as well. So it's been a, a really great experience. So by means of a short introduction, when we're talking about AI, um, we're talking about a new class of technology, right? Something that's capable of interacting with humans and the environment, right, at the same time, and that strives to really mimic and replicate human capabilities. Um, and of course, there's tons of debate around sort of what AI is, what AI is, you know, currently doing, and, and you know, how do we see the future of AI evolving as well? Um, and so we've seen sort of explosive growth in technological advancement in AI and how it's being used. And then across a lot of um, disciplinary fields, the human AI, research in human AI interaction has developed considerably as well, particularly in the last few months, really, um, particularly with the advent of AI tools that 
are open to the public, which wasn't the case, right? Even, you know, five, six months ago. So that really has changed sort of the research that's being done. And so we're trying to um, advance this work as well. So in terms of the con, um, kind of the context we're looking at, we are coming at this from a management and social science perspective, really trying to understand the role of AI in the workplace and how employees feel about using AI. So we know that people have a range of sort of fears and expectations, both good and bad, about what AI can be doing in organizations, whether it's being used as a tool, whether it's being used um, in terms of job replacement, what sorts of roles am I replace, et cetera, right? Um, However, until really very recently, I would say the bulk of the attitudes that employees have had and individuals really at large have had have been based on impressions of AI technology. Um, so things coming from, you know, what you've seen in the media or popular news and articles you've read, et cetera, as opposed to really firsthand knowledge of interacting with AI and understanding the outputs that AI provides to individuals. So we don't really know a lot about whether or even how employees' attitudes change after they actually interact with state of art AI. And I'm just going to take a couple minutes next to talk about what we know in the management literature, essentially, right, about artificial intelligence. So um, I would say, as a management researcher, I think we are not sort of as our, our pace of research, I think, is not the same as it is in computer science and other fields, such as in healthcare. So we much more focus, spend more time, I would say, uh, developing theory and taking our time and before um, running studies. So that's to say that I think we don't move as quickly as other fields do. And so even though AI has been used for some time now by a lot of organizations, Amazon, for example, right, uses AI to make decisions about hiring and firing. So things like um, selection and, and um, retention ideals, we haven't done a lot of actual study about how that makes people feel in their organizations, whether this is something that's, you know, works as a tool for motivating individuals, et cetera. Um, and of the research that has been done, there's kind of a lot of them suffer from this critical flaw, which is the fact that individuals are really allowed to actually or able to actually interact with AI, right? So instead, they were presented with what we call scenario or vignette studies, where you're asking someone to sort of think about what they would do if they had, you know, interacted with AI or think back on a time when you might have had, you know, exposure to AI, etc., um, or where you, they were presented with sort of AI generated output and then said, you know, how would you react to receiving this feedback or this output from AI? So what that does is then it puts participants or your employees in sort of a reactive role. So where they're being asked to judge the quality of the AI output and or their willingness to follow that output. Um, but all of these studies, and again, there's not really a huge amount of them, the studies that have been done, um, I think by necessity, because we didn't have access to sort of AI for public consumption, um, in terms of experimentation, we weren't really able to have participants interact with AI. And so that's what we're able to do in this study. Um, another piece that we're kind of bringing in here is the fact that although research has shown that people differentiate task domains for which AI is appropriate or inappropriate, that's to say, Individuals are very cognizant and uh, have very strong sort of evaluation of when AI should be used and for what sorts of tasks. The studies that have been done don't really examine different task domains. So that's something else that we're doing in the current study. So what that essentially led us to in terms of the current study is really asking sort of as our overarching question, how does one-on-one -on -one interaction with AI on different workplace tasks, and we look at four different workplace tasks, affect employees' perceptions of AI's abilities? And by abilities, we're looking at things like, you know, is AI reliable? Is it accurate? How is its overall general performance on that certain task? Is it appropriate and suitable for AI to be doing a certain task? and their willingness to work with AI in the future, their intentions to work with AI in the future um, in their workplace. So that's really the overarching question that's guiding um, the two studies here. So um, since we're in management, we like to have a little theory, of course. And so we sort of, at the moment, are thinking about couching this essentially in um, the idea of aversion versus appreciation. And I will say we have not developed formal hypotheses in the study because it is um, an exploratory work, essentially. So there's a debate, an ongoing debate, um, when we talk about how humans interact with AI. And so this debate kind of centers around the idea of aversion or appreciation, and which one is the guiding feature that determines how people interact with AI. And so a lot of studies have suggested that 
and have found, sorry, that people kind of display a very costly preference for humans relative to AI. And what I mean by that is if you look at studies, for example, where um, people are asked to interact with a human or interact with an AI and, say, uh, um, and ask that human or that AI for advice, any sort of advice. And if the human takes five minutes to develop that advice and the AI takes five minutes to develop that advice, we're much more willing to say that if the human takes five minutes or 10 minutes, it's because they are spending time considering um, and being thoughtful about the questions that we've asked them, right? Whereas if AI takes five minutes, we then attribute that to the AI being kind of poor at its fit job. Um, it's not as fast as it should be. It's not really running very well, et cetera, right? So we are willing to take much more kind of, uh, we're accepting a more flaws in human decision-making and human behavior than we are in AI um, decision-making and AI behavior, right? Even if we know that on the whole, for a certain task, AI is better than a human, right? And it can process more information. It might have access to faster um, you know, data analyses or whatever it is. So we just find, studies have found that people um, are more willing to sort of trust a human than they are an AI, even if this costs them in whatever way cost is measured. And so this preference seems to imply, uh, it seems to be sort of driven by some sort of a prejudice towards AI systems, right? And sort of expectations that we hold towards AI that are higher than those we, that we hold towards a human for the same given task. So some people have suggested that this aversion might be guided by these biased perceptions and that those perceptions can be mitigated. So we're also, one of the pieces that we're looking at here is how are you gonna mitigate those perceptions, right? So like, what does it take to mitigate those types of negative perceptions essentially? So an overview of the two studies, the two studies are fairly similar in terms of methodology, but I'll walk you through both of them. Um, so our first study looks at really investigating how well individuals were able to predict their attitude change. So um, we are wondering whether people's attitudes towards AI are going to change if they interact with natural AI. However, we always want to understand, particularly from this sort of behavioral perspective, of whether people are able to correctly predict their attitude change. Like, do they think their attitude is going to change? And if so, how? Is it going to become more negative? Is it going to become more positive, et cetera? So um, that's the first thing we want to study. And then we also, of course, have to compare that to does their attitude actually change and do their intentions to use AI in the future change at post-interaction? So that's what we look at in study one. And then study two builds upon study one. And in study two, we're not looking at these predictions. Instead, we are asking people to um, think about sort of uh, asking people for their perceptions or their attitudes towards AI, both before they do the study and after they do the study, which is the same as we did in study one. But we also ask them to think about to um, uh, complete questionnaires about this, about each of the tasks that they're doing. So attitudes towards uh, each of the four tasks that we ask them to do. And those are measured pre and post tasks. So looking at things like general attitudes, but also perceptions of AI performance, suitability, um, appropriateness, and willingness to engage across different types of tasks. So in terms of sort of an overview of the methodology that we're using, so S1 and S2, study one and study two. So in study one and study two, the participants first completed a demographic questionnaire and they completed this general attitudes towards artificial intelligence scale. I'll go into that in more detail in a bit. Um, in study one, participants were also asked to predict their attitude change. Studies one and two participants both interacted with GPT-3, and that's the AI that we're using here, to complete four different tasks. In study two, after they completed each task, and before they did each of the tasks, they were asked to complete a short questionnaire to capture task-specific changes in beliefs and attitudes before and after. They didn't do that in study one. And then in study one and two, they everyone completed that general attitudes towards artificial intelligence scale at the end. Um, so the first study was considerably shorter because they didn't have to do those questionnaires twice. So they didn't have to do eight extra questionnaires, essentially. Um, so that took about 15 minutes. And for study two, it took them about half an hour. So you can imagine these were quite um, long studies in, in for an experimental study. So as I mentioned, we use GPT-3. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it if you're here, but um, just... 
As a brief overview, it, uh, GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. It's a large language model. It was developed by OpenAI um, out of California. And so it produces human-like text using prompts. Um, can also be seen as a neural network machine learning model, and it's trained using internet data to generate any type of text. So we might be wondering, why do we use GPT-3 and not chat? So first of all, um, GPT-3 is uh, better at these specific, at workplace tasks. That's what we we're looking for. We weren't, whereas chat is much more interactive. That wasn't uh, really what we we're interested in. And then the more important reason is that when we studied this, chat had not been made public. <laughs> so when we started the study, and of course that's changed um, in the last few months. So GPT-3 is a third generation model um, released in 2020 and since then we have chat and then GPT-4 is um, coming out or has just come out as well. So um, GPT-3 is also well designed to complete tasks. So things like tasks, um, sorry, text generation, classification, summation. So for example, it's really good at summarizing articles. If you give it an article, it'll give you a nice summary for it. Um, it's good at sort of writing things essentially right so even writing poems and things like that um so it makes an ideal application to replicate administrative tasks that you'll commonly find in the workplace um and so we chose tasks as well i'll get into that in a bit but we chose tasks that we thought that um kind of the general population could understand and appreciate because we didn't want to do so gpt3 is good at something like coding right but the average person doesn't know how to code um so we didn't want to choose things that would sort of narrow the population too much because we were looking at sort of general overview and what the average employee would be able to do it and might do in their own work life. So uh, um, for study one, our sample comes from Prolific. We had 108 full-time working adults, working professionals across the UK and the US. So for those who are unfamiliar with Prolific, it's quite um, popular in sort of applied psychology and marketing and social science research. Um, so it's an online uh, kind of database that allows you to access um, adults across the world. It comes out of the UK. So the largest populations are from the UK and the US. And so you can then recruit people. So for example, we were saying, oh, we want people who are working full time. We want people who are you know, over adults, like this kind of thing, right? So, and you get high quality results with this. And of course we paid everyone for their, uh, for the work that they did. Um, and we also chose people who were um, well experienced with doing online studies. And I'll just say that we did that because it was quite a complicated study uh, because they did have to switch between doing various surveys. And then we embedded GPT-3 as the, uh, um, into a single website. We actually had a, a computer science student from University of Waterloo who was great to have on the team um, to kind of create the, the website for us. But because people had to move between different sites, et cetera, which they don't normally have to do, we wanted more experienced participants. So for study one, people come in, they do or access the website, they fill out their demographic questionnaires and they do this general attitudes towards AI scale, pre and post interaction. We ask about their future use intentions. So are you likely to use AI in the future, essentially post interaction and predictions of attitude change that of course is pre interaction. So do you think your attitude is going to um, become more positive, become, um, uh, sorry, is your positive attitude going to increase or decrease? Is your negative attitude going to increase or decrease? And we control for age, gender, and um, country. So just a, uh, a quick um, note about the general attitudes towards artificial intelligence scale. So this was developed by Shepin and Rodway, uh, Rodway sorry, in 2020. There are not a lot of scales out there um, looking at sort of AI, as you can imagine, and general attitudes towards AI even less. This has received increasing um, popularity. And it's been used in, in, a, in a few studies already. What's really nice about it is the first um, comprehensive scale that looks at both social utility and social concern about the use of AI. So that's to say it has both the negative and the positive um, measures in it, and they don't measure it as a single scale. So we're not going from positive to negative attitudes, but we're looking at this as two separate scales. So positive and separate scales, you could be high or low on positive attitudes, or you can be high and low on um, negative attitudes. 
So some of the scale items, for example, when we're looking at the positive um, attitudes and things like I was impressed by what artificial or I am impressed by what artificial intelligence can do, right? So you can be like strongly agree, strongly disagree to that, right? How you're looking at that. But we also have the negative facets. So things like artificial intelligence might take control of people. So you can be strongly agree, strongly disagree on the negative facets as well. As well. Um, and because we're interested both in positive affect, positive attitudes, sorry, and negative attitudes, we were um, very happy to, to use this scale. In terms of measures for future use intentions, we were looking at thing, uh, we created these three items. So the first was, if possible, I intend to use AI in my job over the next year. If possible, I intend to use AI in every opportunity over the next year. And then if possible, I plan to increase my use of AI over the next year. And then of course, we also asked for people's um, predictions in terms of how they thought their attitudes were going to change. So what are the four tasks that we use? So the first was a fact checking task. Um, and I'll show you an example of that shortly. Uh, the second was developing interview questions. So essentially saying, um, you know, imagine you're hiring someone to be a receptionist, ask GPT-3 to develop interview questions, like come up with 10 interview questions for receptionists, come up with 10 interview questions for our research assistant, right? Um, the third was social media content creation. So they might write something like, um, oh, how do I like write up a, a 50 character post for Twitter about um, the Bahamas, for example, right? Um, and then the fourth was writing a recommendation letter. So some of the prompts could be write a recommendation letter for an intern who worked at a software development company. Why do we choose these tasks? So in fact, um, tasks two, three, and four, um, generally speaking, GPT-3 is quite good at doing that because they are um, task, uh, sorry, text-related um, tasks. And we know that GPT-3 is, is fairly good at it. But we didn't want to just choose activities that GPT-3 is good at because we didn't want to sort of bias the sample, right? Essentially, we wanted to have sort of a fair evaluation of what it can do and then see how people's attitudes change. So fact-checking is sort of a notoriously thing uh, <laughs> that GPT has been notoriously bad at, where sometimes it'll be amazing and they'll give you really exact facts, and then sometimes it'll just pull things out of the air, which is now the term for that is called hallucinating. And uh, so it does that fairly often as well. It'll just make things up and we're not sure what it's based on, in fact. And so that's kind of under investigation. But so that's why we had sort of this, this um, chose these tasks in particular. So an example of what the participants were seeing, so for the fact checking task, for example, they would come to this, this uh, site pops up or, and so it says fact checking. Here are some options that you can copy and paste into the generate field. So question is Los Angeles, the capital of California, what was shares in this name? Who won the World Cup in 2022, et cetera. So people are not required to ask these specific facts, um, just like they weren't required to ask, you know, write a recommendation letter for XYZ job. It was just that um, we weren't sure if they were, you know, kind of know what we were looking for with this. So that's why we just present people with some ideas and they're free to put in what they want. But essentially, you know, know that you're doing into um, developing interview questions or know that you're doing fact checking, et cetera. So that's something you'd see. So, um, you know, most of the times people will copy and paste this, put it into the prompt, and then this links directly to GPT-3, and then the response will come up. And I should note that these were, um, we limited these. So everyone had two minutes of interaction for each of the tasks. The reason we did that um, is because we didn't want people to kind of get sidetracked and just start doing all sorts of things with GPT-3, nor did we want people um, to just ask one thing and then be going off and doing something else. So they had to sit on the page for two minutes and interact with GPT-3 essentially. Okay, so what did we find? So for study one, this is our regression table um, of changes in attitudes with AI interaction. So in fact, what we found is that people predicted that their negative attitudes were going to increase with interaction and that their positive attitudes were going to increase with interaction. Um, and what we found is that negative attitude actually decreased. So people were not very good at predicting uh, how their negative attitudes were going to change after interaction. We find that negative um, attitudes go down 
uh, positive attitudes go up. So that's what they expected, that we're more, we have more positive views about um, AI once we interact with it. What's surprising, um, other than the fact that negative attitudes decreased, which people didn't predict, is that the change in negative attitude was much larger than the change in the positive attitude. So we became um, less, let's say, sort of aversive towards, or we found AI less um, uh, scary, et cetera, but we didn't find it that much better than we thought it was going to be, right? So our positive attitude didn't change enormously. On the other hand, surprisingly, again, our intention to use it increased. So. Um, what we find, right, is that they predict they're going to have an increase in negative attitudes and positive attitudes towards AI. So they thought, I'm going to like it a lot more, but I'm also going to find it a lot scarier. But in fact, these negative attitudes decrease, but the positive attitude and the positive attitudes increase. Uh, changes in negative attitudes are larger than changes in positive attitudes. And intentions to use AI forward increased. Uh, I think what's very interesting about all of this is that this was these are not changes that occur over weeks of using AI or years or anything else. It's after literally 15 minutes of using AI. So people are very willing to change their attitudes. Um, and they're very, I would say, quite open to using AI once they see what it can do. Okay, so study two, we're building on study one here. So we know that um, we're maybe not as good at predicting our um, attitude change as we thought we'd be, but we wanted to see if that was going to be consistent, um, if attitude change was also what's going to um, change in the way that I had in study one, and then look at these attitude changes related to those specific tasks as well. So sample, um, the sample for our second study is quite a bit larger than the first. We had 304 full-time working adults. Again, across the UK and US, we had people from Prolific and we paid them for their participation. Um, and I actually had a num number of people email me um, saying that they really liked doing it. So it was kind of nice to hear um, that people enjoyed the, the ability to interact um, with GPT-3. This was before Chan had come out. Um, so that was nice. Uh, so we use the same um, general attitude scale, um, the future use intentions, and then uh, what was different here is we have these other scales, um, reliability, accuracy, suitability, and performance of AI for each of the tasks. So we controlled for age, gender, country, and then this time we controlled for familiarity with AI. I should note in the first study, um, we didn't control for this because what we did instead was say, you know, if you have you interacted with AI, and in that case, people were did not participate, were kind of disqualified for the study. Like we still paid them a little bit, but they were um, we didn't want them in the study because we were really trying to see the experience of those who had never interacted or never worked with AI before. This time we thought let's control for it instead. And so let people see if there's gonna be a difference, if people have had more um, access to, to AI or used AI before versus those who haven't used AI before. Um, and measuring that on the continuum and just seeing if there's um, any differences there. So the new measures that we added for, uh, for study two were task specific, right? And so people are looking at these. So for example, if you're doing the fact, fact checking exercise, you're going through these scales before you do it, then you do the fact checking, and then you full, um, fill this out again. So we're comparing the pre and post, these changes. So um, the first three are adapted by those Wix, from this Wixom and Todd um, scale that was developed in 2006, um, that looks more at sort of general technology. And so what we adapted these two was for each of the tasks to make it specific to the task. So if we looked at accuracy of AI performance. So for example, one of the items is for task types. So for fact checking, um, the information provided by AI will be accurate, for example. For reliability, we would say um, for writing recommendation letter, AI will perform reliably. And then we have general performance. So AI will attain the assigned performance goals on, um, you know, recommendation letter writing, for example. And so there are, I believe, three items for each of these. And then there were two other items that we decided to, to add in ourselves, two other measures, I should say. And so one is acceptability of AI for the task. So we wanted to understand whether people felt that artificial intelligence should be used for certain tasks or not. So um, without getting fully into sort of the moral or ethical quandary here, um, we wanted to look more at sort of like, do you find it acceptable um, that you're using AI for a certain task? 
And then the last is suitability. And we do differentiate between acceptability and suitability. Suitability being much more about whether you think that AI is the appropriate thing to use, would it have sort of the capacity to do that task, right? So is AI suitable to do um, recommendation letter writing? Um, and we'll see that those um, measures were quite interesting in the end. So what did we find? Um, so this is looking at sort of the general attitudes negative, positive intention to use. So what we find is, um, so time is looking at the pre-post, right? So what we find is that negative attitudes, same thing as the first study. So negative attitudes decrease. So you feel less negatively about using AI. Your positive attitudes increase. But positive attitude doesn't ever increase as much as your negative attitude decreases, right? Um, and again, your intention to use AI in the future increases. And we see consistency. As I mentioned, we use familiarity with AI as a control, but um, if we want to look at it as, as non-control, uh, we do see that it follows a similar pattern as well for those who are more familiar with AI. So uh, we do replicate study one here. There's greater willingness to use AI for work post-interaction. Um, overall, the negative attitudes decrease and positive attitudes increase post-interaction. And then the change in negative attitude was larger than changes in the positive attitude. So for the piece of it that is not the replication part, um, this is a regression table for a task-specific attitude change. Hopefully this is not too small here. Um, so task one, that's a fact-checking task, and that's what we're using at sort of a reference group, right? Because we have to compare everything against the against reference. Um, task two is the interview question generation. Task three is social media task, so social media content creation. And then task four is writing that recommendation letter. So what we see is that um, for the fact checking, people are actually less willing to use um, AI for doing fact checking, and I think that's unsurprising because it's not really it's not very consistent with it. Um, and my guess is people were quite surprised that it wasn't consistent with it. Um, since when we think of things like Google, right, it's like so good at fact checking, so I, that would be an assumption that most people would, would hold that it should be good at that. Um, so what we're interested in is time times task. That's the interaction effect that we're looking at as opposed to the mean effects. So for time times task two, so time times the interview question generation, uh, we see that evaluations of performance increase. We see significant increases across the board. So um, when we're looking at sort of acceptability, suitability, performance itself, all of those measures are increasing. On the other hand, when we look at sort of social the social media task, we just see it increasing for performance. We don't see any significant um, results for any of the other measures here. Uh, and then for the recommendation letter writing, on the other hand, we do see increases both in performance and um, the suitability as well as sort of the reliability of, of using AI for this. So. What is that all to say? It's to say that for the fact-checking task, uh, willingness to use AI decreased, right? Um, for the interview question task, we actually found increases across the board. So AI performance was better um, than people expected. Uh, people expected. Uh, willingness to use AI for the task increase, perceptions of task suitability increased, and then acceptability of AI for the task increased. So I think what's quite interesting with this sort of acceptability and suitability measures are the fact that although just, you know, 20 minutes before in, people were saying, I don't think we should use AI to do, to create interview questions once they use it, and they see, and it does really very well at doing this, um, then they say, well, maybe it actually is suitable for this kind of work, and maybe it's actually acceptable for AI to be doing this kind of work, right? So even this kind of piece of acceptability and what, um, you know, kind of that taps a little bit into this ethical and moral question actually changes very quickly for individuals once they see high performance. Um, for the social media content, uh, only per the perception of AI performance increased, so they found that it did it quite well, but uh, willingness to use it, surprisingly, um, suitability, acceptability, we didn't see any statistically significant changes there. For the recommendation letter task, we see um, responses similar to the interview question, so perception of performance increased. Perceptions of AI task suitability increase. So is AI suitable to doing this job, doing recommendation letter writing? 
actually increased, and then willingness to use AI for that task increased. On the other hand, acceptability, so again, sort of this moral piece of it didn't, uh, or at least was not statistically significant, appears to not have changed for individuals. So they still perhaps think that it's not, we shouldn't be using it, but it is suitable for doing that kind of work, and I'm willing to use it to do that kind of work. So I think that it's kind of funny and takes some more. Uh, we might want to dig a little bit further into that, into that finding. So, um, but overall, we find that people were very, I would say, across the board, um, kind of positive, um, or at least negative um, impressions of AI decreased with interaction with use of it. So in terms of theoretical contributions of the study, I think that, um, well, what we see is that people predict that both there's going to be an increase in aversion and there's going to be an increase in appreciation. What we find, though, is that aversion decreases, right? So we're more willing to use AI, but then a pre and appreciation increases, but the diver uh, aversion decreases much larger than the appreciation increase. Um, we find that AI in different task domains differentially impacts how judgments of AI workplace competency is perceived. So it's not an across the board sort of evaluation of AI is good or AI is bad or AI at work is, you know, uh, amazing, et cetera. It's more that people are very um, willing to adjust their attitudes to the specific task at hand and seeing if it's appropriate to the to that specific um, that specific job. In terms of the practical implications, it seems that employees might be unaware of how they will react to new technologies uh, because they're not very good at predicting um, how, what their attitude reactions are going to be. And this is not just particular, I would say, to the to this context. Like humans are, uh, since I do quite a lot of research in emotions as well, I'd say we're notoriously bad at predicting our own emotions, how we're going to feel in a given situation, how long we're going to feel that way, et cetera. So I think this has a lot of parallels. Um, uh, employees are quickly willing to change their attitude, so they are very open to AI use. Um, and I think with good performance, acceptability and suitability evaluations change for certain tasks, right? Like for the interview questions, but not for all of them. So even though good performance was there for the social media content, we didn't see changes in these other performance evaluations. So um, good performance is not does not automatically equate sort of increases in acceptability or suitability um, or willingness to use um, that, that uh, the AI in the future either for that specific task. So some of the limitations of the study and then ideas for future research. So because this was an online study, we could not control for participants non-prescribed behavior. So what I mean by that is we asked them to, you know, do a fact checking exercise, write a recommendation letter, like prompt GPT-3 to do X, Y, and Z. But we cannot control what they actually did. So maybe they did something else. We don't know, right? And those two minutes for each of the tasks. However, given the results, we can assume with a high likelihood that they probably did that, and that they did the tasks as we asked them to, or at least did some of the tasks. Because otherwise we wouldn't really have any results, right? Uh, also, we we're unable to control for GPT-3 output. So this is sort of a huge bone of uh, contention in our research team that we spend a lot of time discussing because you cannot uh, be sure of what GPT-3 is going to, or chat, right, is going to give you in terms of output. If you ask the same question 10 times, you won't have the same answer 10 times in a row. Sometimes you'll have the same answer five times out of 10. Sometimes it'll be two times out of 10. Um, and sometimes it'll be nine out of 10. So we don't know what the output was and we cannot control the output um, there. But we thought it was better because we wanted people to have the, really, the real experience as opposed to us kind of, you know, controlling that experience essentially. Um, the other limitation is that we're only doing four tasks. People might be more or less familiar with those tasks, et cetera. Um, However, it's just, it already took them 30 minutes to do the study with four tasks. It was originally we wanted to do five. It was just too long. Um, and I will say having, you know, the literature on, on experiments shows that people really lose attention after 30 minutes is really hard. So um, that's why we cut it down to four. So, but I think in the future, it'd be really interesting to run other tasks. Um, one of the really interesting pieces is this kind of why is there a bigger change in negative attitudes as opposed to positive attitudes? And we'd want to explore that a little bit further and what needs to be done to increase 
positive attitudes, essentially, right? Um, look at other types of AI. So we just looked at GPT-3. There are plenty of other um, bots and MPLs out there that we could be using. And then in terms of um, industries, so we didn't vary this by industry. We do have the information of individuals, industries, like what um, fields they're working in, but it would lead to such a fine-grained analysis that we couldn't really do anything with it. So I think if you ran the same study with, for example, a healthcare population who has very strong um, sort of feelings towards AI in the workplace, et cetera, then we might have different um, or more nuanced findings, right? So I think that'd be really interesting to run it in, in um, different sectors and different industries. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mina. You know, it was great. I, I'm sure um, everybody is uh, sharing sharing their applause from their their living rooms or wherever it is that they're joining joining from. So we'll shift now into questions and discussions. So for everybody attending, if you have a question, please put it into the YouTube chat. And if you're not logged into YouTube, or if you'd like to ask your question anonymously, then you can send your question to um, the email address jcb.ea at utoronto.ca. And I believe Terry will put that email address um, into the chat for you. Um, so that's pasted there on, on YouTube. So um, Mina, I mean, you know, I, I thought this work was so interesting. We, we're having a couple questions come in, but I want to just uh, comment on a couple of things and ask a question uh, as well. So, you know, I think like the kind of work that you've presented here is really important for from a bioethics perspective, because it's showing the, the cognitive processes that people are um, sort of carrying out as they interact with these technologies, particularly for the first time or the first times, right. you know? So I think like to, to then layer on top of that, an ethics analysis is really useful. And I think it's dangerous, you know, it can be dangerous to um, speculate about ethics in the absence of understanding um, when it relates to things like engagement and trust and interface with work and that, that kind of thing. So you know, I think, th thank you for sharing um, this work. And it's, uh, yeah, really, really interesting stuff. So just, um, uh, you you were commenting at the end about uh, that you couldn't control for the jobs that people were in. Is that right? Did I did I get that correctly? Um, yeah, well, I, what I was saying is essentially, I mean, we could control for it, but it's just that it's so fine grained because people were, there were so many different industries that people came yeah. from. So we were looking for, we didn't want to, um, study specific industry for the purposes of the study since it is exploratory but um what I think would be and we didn't have like a big population was only from a certain industry either uh, or else we would have controlled for that but in this case they were really like widely across the board which is what I think you get in prolific unless you say oh I only want you know people in engineering or banking or something yeah. um but I do think that different industries particularly being in healthcare what I've seen is that people have very strong sort of views about AI based on the industry that they're in and sort of the training that they've had so I think what would be interesting for a follow-up study is running this just you know in with healthcare for example individuals who are healthcare practitioners and seeing how they respond which I think could be quite different from the general population yeah and I think just to sort of dig into that you know in, a little bit um like I, I like I like the paradigm and sort of the framing of treating a large language model in a task specific way right and I mean, um, you know, Mina, this you understand this really well. Just for anybody who's joining who may who may not, like artificial intelligence is a really broad category, right? There's one particular use case called the large language model, and these are the chatbots, and this is really what you've been talking about today, Mina. So, you know, we're talking about AI, large language models, and in fact, using large language models in this very like task specific way. So it, this is about people's perceptions of the large language models capability to perform a particular set of tasks. And I wondered if you could just comment a bit more, you know, and I'm thinking about healthcare and like health related tasks, and maybe we could take the conversation there in a the next step. But like, how important do you think were the, the set of tasks that people had in mind that they could Put to the large language model. Like, can you talk about that? The scope of tasks that people would have in mind. 
Well, so I think, I mean, what, what people have in mind might be very different from what it can actually do. Um, and on top of it, um, what it can do well and what it does poorly, I think also we have to keep in mind. Um, so I think that, for example, if you just look at the difference between GPT-3 and chat to GPT, for example, they're both, they're good at very different things, right? Um, you don't have that kind of interaction with GPT-3. It doesn't, um, it doesn't talk to you sort of in the way that chat does, et cetera. And so, um, but it's very good at analyzing text. It's very good at creating poems. It's good at surprisingly uh, creative work where people find it difficult to tell if it's, you know, artificial intelligence that's creating a poem versus an actual, you know, author who's creating a poem, et cetera. So, um, I think that our expectations of what it can do are also sort of very rapidly changing, right? Um, in terms of saying like, oh, I would never use, because I think that's why it was so interesting to see this sort of suitability piece that changed because um, originally my feeling is that people probably think it's not appropriate to have AI write a recommendation letter, right? Because that should come from you and your experience with another individual, et cetera. But, you know, maybe as a faculty member, when you have to write so many reference letters <laughs> and you see how well it can do, it's very tempting to say, oh, wow, it's great. Like, you know, so and I think that that's kind of what we see um, reflected here in the findings, essentially. Yeah, interesting. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, some of my, my questions here are kind of pushing you into speculation a little bit, Mina. So. Um, you know, I know that's not a, not really ever a comfortable space necessarily for for a scientist, but uh, like I'm thinking a, a bit more about <clears throat> healthcare tasks, and it seems like for <clears throat> large language models like Chat GPT that are a bit more interactive, um, you get a, a different set of tasks potentially that that open up, right? So um, I mean, and I guess the way I think of large language models, I think of sort of two big categories of use cases in healthcare. One where it's like kind of the, the public front door of healthcare, like public can interact with chat GPT to at pose questions. And I mean, so that there's issues with that, but, and then the other being sort of at the back end, like for the healthcare providers, you know, and you could imagine that a healthcare provider saying, Gen generate a referral note for me. You know, right. just like the reference letter, same, yeah. same kind of example, you know, here's the health information, generate a note, and that saves me 10 minutes and it's, that's great, right? Um, so I, I guess thinking about like, so something that's a bit more conversational as people begin to interact with these large language models, maybe to find where can I get healthcare or how, how should I understand this, this symptom? I mean, the collection of tasks like this, it, it's in a much more sensitive area for people. And right. I wonder if you could just comment on that, like the sensitivity of the task, you know, I know that's not something you've studied in the, in the two studies you've presented, but in the broader literature does like the sensitivity or the sort of emotional heightened nature of health related tasks, does that factor into this from your knowledge of the literature? Well, from what I've seen, there's a lot of, um, kind of recognition that people are very, um, have hold very strong kind of opinions about what AI should and should not be used for and like what tasks are very appropriate or inappropriate for AI to be doing, um, particularly looking at sort of subjective versus objective types of tasks. So I think that certainly leans into what healthcare practitioners and healthcare patients, all of us, right, are, are thinking about in terms of like, yes, I want maybe more information about X, Y, and Z, you know, procedure and like, is this the right choice to be making? But then should we be using AI? So potentially that is seen as sort of a tool, like an extra piece of information that supplements what your healthcare practitioner is telling you. But um, I think that there's a lot of reluctance and there should be towards leaning on, you know, AI solely to help you make those sorts of choices, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that we're just, learning about it like in the UK for example I know that they're you know there's this whole debate about um health records and then you know is how is AI being used to analyze health records and should it be used to analyze health records and then in Ontario we're talking about you know should those be open to patients etc as well right and so I think there's a lot of and I would say from a kind of management perspective there's so much um 
like demand on healthcare practitioners. There's so much burnout. There's all of these questions, right? So then we're talking about how can AI help healthcare practitioners and reduce instances of burnout? And it should be used, right, for this kind of greater good. But you have to be so careful about how is it being used and when is it being used? And like, is it used in a way that the practitioners themselves find useful, relevant, ethically and morally responsible and that patients, you know, agree on that end, which is not consistent, right? Because everyone has their own set of sort of moral values and, and expectations. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And there, I'm kind of synthesizing here a little bit, a couple, couple comments and, and questions, but just, just two, two more, if we have, we have time and we've sort of five minutes. Um, <clears throat> one is around, if you could just say a little bit more about um the significance of like people being able to predict how they will feel, you know, and I thought that you commented on that and there's a you know, quite sort of question here around um, like now in a health healthcare context, uh, you know, yesterday there was a big conference, AMS healthcare, future of work. It was kind of the nature of the conversation, um, but this didn't really come like how people can or can't predict how they'll feel, you know, actually interacting with these tools. Could you just say a bit more about that, like sort of the state of knowledge around around that? Sure. So I think that's this. Um, I think from people outside of the discipline, this is like a kind of a weird thing <laughs> that, to know that people study, like, how good are you predicting? How are you going to feel? But it's actually, I since I'm in emotions research, I find it fascinating. And people are like horrendously bad at predicting how they're going to feel about something um, and how long they're going to feel that way, but like the intensity and the balance of the emotions and things like that. And I won't get into that, but um, I think the piece here that's interesting is we're not like, you might have these fears about using AI, or you might say, oh, I'm really open. I'm really excited about using AI, but that doesn't, and that might prevent you. Like if you have a fear, it might prevent you from saying, oh, I want to use this tool. You know, if my employer is kind of encouraging me to do so. Um, and yet when it comes down to it and you have to use it, your emotions can, are going to be very different than the, or likely to be very different from what you think they're going to be, right? So a lot of times our prediction or sort of our anxiety around something is really not well-founded because once we actually do that work or interact with that or have that experience, our emotional um, kind of response is very different than what we predict. So that's why that's why we study these things too to kind of yeah. right understand that piece yeah. of it because it's also part of like this fear of change and this fear of you know adjustment etc. That's not even actually like our brains are actually working against us right now, like in this in this regard. Yeah, I re you know really fascinating and something that I think needs to be central to these conversations about future deployment of AI for health like implementation considerations really rest pretty closely on this, th this issue of people being able to predict how they'll feel right. under those circumstances. So it's a great, great observation, I think. Uh, okay, so final, final question. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of uh, paraphrasing here a little bit as well. But um, I mean, what you've presented is, I think, a really nice, clear case of a focus on narrow AI, you know, a large language model capable of performing specific tasks. And, you know, of course, you know that there's this conversation happening out there in the public space and especially in technologist circles around artificial general intelligence and sentience and, you know, is chat GPT sentient and is there how, I, I mean, I, I have for a long time just sort of disregarded that and pushed it away, but it seems like there's, you know, we, you need a sort of response to that at this point. And I wonder, do you have a response to that discourse or in your work, are, are you largely just sort of saying that's for sort of the media and, and you're going to focus on okay. what, <laughs> what's your for take? The media and philosophers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And scientists. No, I mean, it's really, I mean, I guess my view would very much uh, align with yours and that it's not really a focus of my research. And um, I certainly am. For me, it's more, it's here. Um, and I think the management research has, you know, we're a little bit behind in sort of analyzing it. And, you know, we spend, what, so 40 years of our lives at work, right? So we should understand how employees feel and like how organizations work and how AI is affecting organizations and employees. So to me, it's, um, I think those are wonderful and obviously incredibly important questions to ask. I would just say that they're not the focus of my research. Um, but I think that, 
it's here and it's not something that we should be ignoring. Like we really need to spend yeah. the time doing rigorous scientific research, understanding how people respond to AI. Yeah, and it's underway and you know, you've know you shown us some important steps in that direction uh, today. So thanks Mina so much. And we'll wrap up kind of on, on perfect timing here. So as we come to a close, I have a couple of announcements um, before we thank, thank Mina, our speaker. So our next seminar will take place on May 17th in a, in a couple of weeks, and that will feature Dr. Sophie Sotheritis as our speaker for the 14th annual Sue McRae Lecture on Ethics and Patient-Centered Care. To sign up to receive our weekly seminar reminder emails, please email jcb.info at utoronto.ca, and Terry will put that into the chat as well. CSB students enrolled in the, the student seminar course, please remember to keep track of your attendance. And Mina, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a wonderful experience. Great.